All right, Neil, thanks for being on. First question is coming from Orlando Sanchez with KGW. Well, first, guys, everybody that's on, I, I appreciate you being on, and I hope uh, I hope all your families are, are safe and, and healthy. So I think that's the most important thing we're all thinking about right now. But uh, go ahead, Orlando. Welcome. All right, Neil, I think uh, I'm unmuted. Uh, thanks for, for doing this, first and foremost. Uh, how would you assess free agency just – how different was it compared to years of the past? And how would you say you guys did? Well, I think uh, not dissimilar to things in the past other than, you know, not hopping on and off planes, you know, to go to make in-person visits. Um, so a lot of stuff, the interviews were done uh, similarly to the draft in that we we focused on Zoom interviews with players. Um, you know, we, we communicated more through the agents. And, you know, players were probably more apt to make quicker decisions because instead of having to entertain people, you know, in person, they were able to just kind of do zoom interview and over zoom interview. So, so that expedited the process a little bit, as you could tell, I mean, 85 to 90% of free agency was done within 24 to 36 hours. So we were probably in the same timeline as everyone else. And, you know, we're happy with the off season. Um, you know, we're not traditionally a free agent destination, um, but based on what we had to offer, which, which was a defined negotiation at the mid level, um, we accomplished one of our goals. We wanted to get, we wanted to be more athletic. We wanted to be better defensively this year. We wanted more versatility on the perimeter. Um, we wanted to be able to switch more and we wanted to be more disruptive as a defense and be more aggressive on that end. So, you know, in free agency, getting a guy like Derek, uh, who's an elite athlete, you can protect the rim. He's a great finisher, you know, rates in the 80th percentile and blocks and steals was a big win for us. And, um, you know, free agent wise also, you know, obviously getting Carmelo back was probably the most important thing, honestly, you know, what he does for our spirit and our culture and the way he was able to perform and compliment our guys on the court um, and make an impact right away. Have a guy that's willing to take and make big shots down the stretch was huge. And um, we think we got a really nice player with Harry Giles, who, you know, is somewhere between a young developmental guy and a guy that's been in the league long enough where you can put him in a meaningful game. All right, the next question is coming from Jason Quick with The Athletic. Go ahead, Jason. All right, we'll circle back. Next question is coming from Aaron Fentress with The Oregonian. Hi, Neil. Can you walk us through sort of the, the what led you to Covington and pursuing that deal and how quickly that uh, transaction was ironed out with him and, and why you uh, went after him so quickly? Well, again, um, you know, our offseason focus, we believe the biggest upside for this roster is on the defensive end of the court. Um, you know, we were a top three offense. We had the best offense in the league in the bubble, but we ranked 27th in defensive efficiency. So clearly that was a need. Um, part of that is going to have to be addressed strategically in terms of how we're planning to play. But the majority of that needed to be solved from a personnel standpoint, which is my responsibility. So, you know, obviously Robert's one of the elite defenders in the league. He's a former first team all, all league defender. Um, he makes threes. He's a perfect complement to Damon she CJ. He's a low usage guy. Doesn't need the ball as much offensively. He plays traditionally off the pass. Um, and what we identified knowing the contract we had to convey you know, we set a reserve price at, you know, Trevor's contract plus, you know, two protected draft picks, basically, was what we were willing to convey. We identified a few players around the league. Robert was at the top of the list, and we found a willing partner with Houston. All right, next question is coming from AJ McCord with COIN. Hey, Neil. So last year, I remember sitting at Media Day and you guys were really excited because you got so many players that you had previously tried to get. But then the pieces just didn't work out on the court. How much does familiarity with these players that you reacquired in your system specifically give you confidence like Carmelo, like Rodney, like Enes Cantor, who've all played with Damon CJ, with Nurk in this system before? Well, I'd also like to say, I mean, Part of the reason some of the guys didn't work, AJ, was they weren't actually on the court, right? I mean, unfortunately, we kind of got 
dinged by injuries. Um, you know, Powell never got a chance to play for us. We had other guys beaten up. So, um, but I, I totally take your point, and I think it's 100% accurate. I mean, in a, in a year where we're going to have an accelerated camp, everything's abbreviated. I mean, guys aren't even going to be on the floor for team activities until, you know, December 6th. And we're going to basically get a week of practice before we've got to play preseason games and then open the season on the 22nd. So I don't think any of us have the luxury to take, you know, an entire off season, you know, the month of September um, and October to gel and blend and, you know, build chemistry. So the fact that we have guys that not only do our returning players know our system, but bringing a guy like Ennis back who, you know, probably had one of his best years in our system will make that learning curve much shorter. And, then getting veterans, you know, guys like Robert Covington, um, you know, that he has been on multiple teams and been a high impact guy wherever he's gone because, you know, he understands his role and his skill set will make an easy transition. And, um, you know, even Derek, you know, with Derek Jones comes from an outstanding program in Miami. Um, you know, they're elite defensively. They're a winning program. So he'll be about the right stuff when he gets here and his transition should be pretty easy as well. So we're hoping that the continuity combined with some of the player retention along with the new additions will give us an edge because traditionally the years we've started really well, we've had big years. The years we've kind of started out of the gates a little slower, it's been an uphill climb to get back into the playoff race. Next question is coming from Nick Krupke with KPTV. Hey, Neil, happy early Thanksgiving. Uh, as uniquely challenged as life has been on and off the floor in, in all phases, are there any benefits, though, to this quick turnaround from one season to the next for you guys in building a roster and retaining some of your own? No, I, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, you know, I do think that the guys that, you know, like Hoodie that returned, I mean, there wasn't enough of a gap for them to, you know, forget what it's like to be here, you know, with, um, you know, kind of the organization we have. Um, you know, he was still rehabbing, so – it gave us an ability to kind of stay in touch with him. But no, I, look, I, I think we're, we're all doing what we need to do to get the season back on track and, you know, get back to playing basketball. But, you know, there are challenges that come with it. We have certain guys that are still rehabbing that maybe aren't 100 um, percent, which will present some challenges. But, you know, I, I just I think that, you know, the momentum that we created by playing well in the bubble um, will lead into this season and that'll help, you know, with a shorter window. But. I don't know that you'll talk to any coach or front office or players that ideally wouldn't like to have the luxury of more time if it was afforded to them. All right. Uh, we're going to go with Jason Quick from The Athletic. Neil, uh, are you all done? Will you use the biannual? We don't have the biannual, Jace, um, unless we were willing to go into the tax. That's why our last two spots were minimums. Um, once we used our mid-level, our full mid-level, and, um, you know, and, and the Ennis Cantor trade, obviously he makes $3 million a year more than Mario was scheduled to make. It eliminated our biannual as a vehicle. So our last two spots were minimum spots. And right now we're 600000 under the tax. We plan to stay there because we were in the last two years and we don't want to enter a repeater zone um, in terms of being a luxury tax repeater team right now. So we're going to stay where we are. Um, a 15th guy would just be somebody on the inactive list anyway. So we're comfortable with 14 players. How come you didn't uh, pursue a backup point guard? We have a backup point guard. It's Anthony Simons. Okay. We have, you know, guys, we, I know this becomes a question, but 95% of our possessions last year were played with Dame or CJ at point guard. That's our model. And we believe Anthony Simons is as good or better as any of the minimum point guards we'd be able to go out to go get. Next question is coming from Dwight Janes with NBC Sports Northwest. Hi, Neil. I, I'm curious, uh, how many of your guys are here working out, playing pickup already at the PF? And if so, uh, is Rodney Hood taking part in those uh, games? Can he play yet? And what about Zach? Okay. Um, well, I mean, well, I don't know if you can see. There's Zach right there, if you guys can see. Um, we're, um, I'm, I'm right outside the door right now. I mean, right now out there is Zach, Rodney, CJ. Um, and I think we have one more. We're only allowed four right now uh, in the building at a time. I think uh, Nasir's out there as well. 
Uh, we're not playing pickup yet, Dwight. Um, we start our testing protocols tomorrow. Um, right now it's all one on O like it was pre bubble. Um, so we are not playing uh, any five on five, but Rodney is in working out every day. Um, right now in market, uh, Cub just got here. Derek comes tomorrow. Uh, Mel will be here later in the week. So I think the only guy, Nurk is in Bosnia right now dealing with a family issue. Um, Ennis Cantor arrives for his physical later tonight. And Derek Jones arrives tomorrow for his physical. And Harry Giles will be here later tonight and do his physical tomorrow. So everybody else is in market, um, doing workouts with the coaches, doing strength and conditioning work. But we're still adhering to the COVID protocols um, to keep everybody safe until we can start doing daily testing. Um, as far as Zach, he's in working out every day, but his timeline is probably closer to the second or third week in January than it is to opening night. Next question is coming from Joe Freeman with the Oregonian. Hey, Neil. Uh, first of all, could you circle back to Rodney and, and do you expect him ready for, uh, for opening night? And then in lo larger picture, how, do your, how does this offseason position you in the West, do you think? How close uh, do these moves get you to where you want to be? Well, with Rodney, yeah, he's, he's certainly tracking towards being available opening night. He'll basically be one year post-surgery. Uh, by the time, you know, opening night comes around, he's done a great job with his rehab. Um, you know, I mean, look, that's for the pundits, Joe. I, I, look, I think, I think we're a better team than we were last year. I think we're deeper. I think our biggest challenge was on the defensive end of the floor and, um, you know, finishing out possessions and closing them out with rebounds. So obviously we added two elite defenders with uh, Robert Covington and Derek Jones. Um, we're certainly getting better rebounding, you know, um, Robert Covington's an excellent rebounder. So is Derek. And then we've all seen what Ennis Cantor can do on the offensive glass. So like I said, I think our two biggest challenges were, you know, getting stops and then closing out those possessions with defensive rebounds and, you know, I think we've added players that fill those needs. So, um, you know, we're, we're always going to be bullish on our team. But at the end of the day, look, we're, we were high on the roster last year, and I think it's a combination of both. We, we have the guys we thought were really going to contribute to a deep run in the playoffs from last year's team, and we've added and complemented them with what we did in free agency and trades. Next question is coming from Joe Becker with K2. Uh, Neil, earlier on, you talked about the importance of bringing back Carmelo Anthony. Um, he's in his late 30s, went more than a year without playing NBA basketball, and yet he came back, played great for you. What's impressed you most with Carmelo since he's been joining the Blazers? Well, I think the most impressive thing with Melo is that he's a purist. I mean, he just loves basketball. Um, you know, the day that I, you know, I called him to get him to docu sign the contract yesterday, he was in the gym. Um, you know, working out. I mean, he, he just, he wants to be a part of the game. Um, you know, he's made a commitment to staying in great shape. Um, he's obviously a guy that can play in big moments and big games. And he's an incredible spirit for us to have around our building. And, you know, the, the nicest thing for us, Joe, is, you know, we've kind of become somewhat of custodians of his legacy to a certain degree. And the fact that, you know, he's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer and you know, the longer he stays in Portland, the more identifiable he is with the Trailblazers at this point in his career. Um, and to be able to contribute to that and, you know, and, and participate in his legacy is, is really exciting for all of us. And I think, you know, the gravitas that he walks into this building with every day, you know, alleviates some of the pressure that we put on the other leaders like Damon CJ. You know, this gives, gives our young guys someone to look up to. I mean, they all revere Dame as a player, but, you know, Melo's a guy, a lot of these guys, Nasir Little, Harry Giles, C.J. Ellaby, Anthony Simons, I mean, they grew up with Melo's poster on their walls, right? They played him in 2K. So, you know, having him be willing to come back to Portland um, after a year, last year might have been a reclamation year, but he had multiple opportunities with, with many teams this year to join and play the kind of role he'll play for us. And the fact that he chose us over them, is a really nice validation with that, that we're doing things the right way and we're treating people well when they're here. Next question is coming from Sean Hyken with Bleacher Report. 
Neil, going back to the, I, the, you know, guys being in the facility, what have you heard from the league office about what the protocols are going to be during the season, how often guys are going to get tested, what's going to be, what happens if there's a positive, like, like what has the league told you about that kind of stuff at this point? You know, I wish I could tell you, you know, Sean, I could recite a chapter and verse, but, you know, really we leave that up to Jeff Clark. Um, you know, since all this stuff came out, we've been buried with the draft and free agency. I mean, we are, we are starting testing tomorrow. Players need to get tested tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, they need to self-isolate at home if they're on track one to be in the building on December 1st. Um, their family members can get tested as well. If they check in a little bit later, then they'll be in the building starting December 5th. Um, but as far as like the different variations of what happens if someone tests positive, how they're isolated, we're living in a world outside the bubble, you know, 50, 50, 60 page memos. I just, I haven't grinded through them. I leave that up to our medical people. I just go where they tell me to go and do what they tell me to do. Next question is coming from Aaron Fentress with the Oregonian. Neil, when everyone's healthy, you know, weeks down the line, you're, you guys are pretty loaded at forward. Any concern about how the minutes are going to be uh, passed around there or be able to keep people happy? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, let's do this. I mean, Aaron, like, who do you think are the forwards? So that maybe you and I have different ideas of positions for guys. And I can tell that I can talk through it probably more accurately. Well, Zach Collins, Covington, Hood, Jones can play the three or the two. You guys played Trent at some small forward last year, Carmelo. Okay. Um, well, I mean, we look at Rodney as a guard, like as a, a shooting guard, small forward. I mean, he's definitely not a power forward. Um, Zach is a four or five, but, you know, look, starting the season, Aaron, we've only got two guys over six, eight that are healthy right now with, you know, with Nurk and with um, Ennis. And that's why we signed Harry. You know, he gives us a different look. Um, he gives us that athletic mobile center um, that can play against some, some of the more undersized guys that we have trouble with at times. You know, we've got, you know, we've got Mello and, you know, Cub, you know, at four, I think Derek can slide there as well. So a lot of it is we want the versatility. Um, the league is going more positionless. What we wanted really was guys that can play multiple positions that have defensive versatility that are more athletic, that are longer. They can shrink the court. They're more switchable. They can be more disruptive defensively. We're hoping to get out and transition a little bit more, get some more easy baskets. So, um, you know, I mean, look, I think the vulnerability is you've got to go into the season basing things on worst case scenario. We think we've got incredible depth and we've had health in our backcourts, but we've been vulnerable to injury last year. You know, we ended up how never played Zach got hurt right out of the gate. Um, you know, Nurk, Nurk was back on a longer timeline than anticipated. And, you know, suddenly we woke up and Hassan Whiteside was the only guy that could play the five position. So, you know, we want depth and we want versatility and we think we have both. Next question is coming from Jason Quick with The Athletic. Now, what kind of discussions did you have with Mello regarding role and specifically was coming off the bench broached? Yeah, it was. Um, you know, Mello understands right now. You know, look, I think ideally for him, he would still start. I mean, I think that's where his mindset is. He's never come off the bench. You know, obviously that'll be Terry's call. But, you know, I think the conversation, Jason, was, you know, make the decision to come back based on the reality that you'll likely come off the bench to start the game. If that's, if that's not an oxymoron, I guess. <laughs> um, but he'll probably come off the bench. I think, I think he can be featured more with the second unit. Um, you know, in a first unit where you have Dame, CJ, Nurk, right? Like, you know, with Mello last year it was different, but I think with, you know, depending on who starts at three, we assume it's Cub, um, you know, and Derek, you know, there may not be as many shots there for him. So being able to feature him with the second group, get him some post-ups, um, you know, have him be more of a target for plays with that second group probably gives him, you know, a higher usage with the second group than the first group. And then, you know, like Mel and I talked, Mel and I talked about, I mean, if his minutes get limited more into like the 20, 22 minute range, we're not as concerned about back to backs, right? We're not getting the wear and tear. We're not extending him. If he's having a night, you know, where he's got it going, Terry can extend and go longer. You know, if it's a third game in four nights, maybe he plays shorter minutes so we can kind of preserve them. Um, I also think what's important, it's 
guys get too caught up in who starts. It's really about who finishes games. And I think based on matchups, based on what we need on the floor, you know, the trust factor with Mello in terms of making big shots and understanding what it takes, as you guys all saw in the bubble, to close out a playoff caliber game, you know, that's where we'll need Mello as well. And we'll want him to be fresh in those minutes. Got another question coming from Aaron Fentress. Coach, can you tell us uh, what attracted you to CJ Ellaby and, and how you think he might fit in either this year or down the line? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we loved his size. Um, he's a stat monster. Um, you know, the analytics guys call them green lanterns, which means the entire analytics side of his profile on the defensive end, steals, blocks, deflections, um, you know, defensive efficiency lit up like all in green. Um, we think he's going to be a good shooter at this level. He can handle, he can make plays. Um, you know, if you look at his numbers, you know, he went from being a facilitator as a freshman to a go-to featured scorer as a sophomore. Um, he's young. And, you know, we've had, we've had a lot of success with guys that are just really good basketball players in the second round. And I think that's what he's going to bring. I think he's a really good basketball player. I think, you know, I think we'll all probably anticipate based on our history that this year will be an apprenticeship for him. Um, but he'll have a chance to compete every day with really good young players. And um, like I said, I think he's another guy that as a second round pick late in the second round has a chance to have a very long NBA career. Thanks. Got a question coming from Jamie Hudson with N NBC Sports Northwest. Hey, Neil, didn't get to talk to you much about Gary Trent Jr. and what he did last season. With that, what are you expecting from him this year going forward? Well, hopefully more of the same. Um, you know, I think it just shows, you know, you know, when talent meets opportunity and hard work, you know, guys produce. And, you know, obviously, you know, Gary had played throughout the season, but, you know, not as much as maybe he would have liked. And then circumstantially, you know, Trevor had a family obligation and Rodney was hurt and he kind of became the, you know, the default sixth man to a certain degree. And, you know, he took advantage of the opportunity. I expect him to build off that this year. I mean, he's probably one of the hot names coming out of the bubble. Um, his commitment on the defensive end, you know, everyone looks to the shooting and he was, he was, he was unconscious in the bubble. He shot the ball at a high rate, which we knew he could do. But the biggest thing for Gary was the energy and commitment he made on the defensive end. I think is the reason Terry had so much faith in him, you know, to keep him in games at critical moments. Our, our best lineup in the bubble was our closing lineup of Dame, CJ, Gary, Carmelo, and Nurk. Um, and that's a testament to Gary's hard work on the offensive end. I think he went from shooting 25 from three as a rookie to 41% from three as a, uh, as a second year player. But really it was, he was our go-to defensive stopper. I mean, he guarded everybody from LeBron to Ja Morant to Kawhi and everybody else down there. And that's why we we're able to go seven and two and, um, you know, and compete in the playoffs. So, I, like I said, I think Gary will build on it. He worked as hard as anybody in the months after the bubble before um, we got back in the building. And um, like I said, I think he's, he's what our league is about right now, Jamie, on the perimeter. He's a guy that can guard multiple spots, and he's become really efficient at knowing, you know, what the return on a, on a three is versus, you know, twos off the dribble. So he's found his niche in our league, what everybody's looking for, which is a three and D guy. And I expect him to capitalize on it for the rest of this season as well. All right, we've got time for three more. Uh, first one's coming from Orlando Sanchez with KGW. Hey, Neil, how, uh, how much is Jody involved and how have things kind of changed? Do you have a little more control? How did that go this off, off season, this free agency? Well, I'm, I'm not getting as many links to blogs and um, internet reports. I know that. Um, Jody's been phenomenal. Um, look, she, Jody is, is different than Paul. You know, Paul loved the day-to-day. -day. I mean, Paul was like, wanted to talk about all the transactions, what different teams were doing. And, you know, he really liked to kind of do the post-mortem on a transaction even before the guy took the floor. And um, I think Jody's much more big picture. Um, Jody likes us to present her with a plan make recommendations. Um, she evaluates that plan and then determines what the best course of action is for the, you know, for the, the, uh, the path that the organization is on. So, you know, the mandates from Jody have been, we want to win. We want to compete. We want to put the best team on the floor. 
Um, she feels an obligation to guys like Damon CJ, who've made long-term commitments to us that we make transactions that are going to give them a, an ability to maximize their time here. Um, and we, you know, and we're, we felt that obligation as well. So she's a passionate fan. She's a tireless advocate for what we're trying to do. And Jody's on top of things on a day-to-day -day basis, but she really, you know, really wants to more, you know, trust and empower her people to execute the plan she approves of. So, you know, we spend a lot of prep time, you know, kind of devising what our strategy is going to be. Um, we have different permutations of that strategy so that we can go in different directions based on the conditions that we run into on the ground. And we execute and then we, you know, we, we hold ourselves and she holds us accountable for the results. Next question is coming from Jason Quick. You know, I have kind of a two-part question. One, can you kind of give some uh, further clarity on how you guys view Covington and Jones positionally? And then also, it looks like a lot of the moves you made uh, give you a lot of flexibility moving forward. Is it, was that by design? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think we look at um, – at, at DJ and Cov, kind of a little bit, not dissimilar to the old Farouk Mo model, right? They can switch. They can both play either position. Um, you know, both guys are elite defenders. They've got length. Um, you know, like I said, Cov is more of a catch and shoot guy. And I think, you know, Derek is going to be more, you know, pass, cut, move without the ball, slash, um, you know, generate a lot of his offensive production through his energy and athleticism. But I think those guys are interchangeable. I think, you know, if we start either of them, there's an argument that one could be called power forward, the other could be called small forward. It really doesn't change kind of how we play on either end of the floor, which I think gives us a lot of flexibility. And I think the fact that either of them can move to either position. So either one can slide to four with Hoodie at three or Gary at three, and either one can move to back to three with Carmelo at four or, you know, one of the bigs at four. So that I think Position list is more how I describe them than position specific. And from a flexibility standpoint, Jace, you're right. I mean, I think, you know, we really wanted to, you know, know that we had some liquidity when it came to, you know, other transactions down the road. Um, you know, we want to see how things work uh, with our group. And we do. We have future flexibility, but the core is still there. You know, Dame, CJ, Nurk are the core that we build around. You know, we make decisions around what best complements them. And we just keep trying to look, you know, to make these transactions to find more core pieces. And part of our, I think, went back to Aaron's, maybe Aaron's question or Orlando's, which was, you know, our goal when we were, when we entered the off season through draft and free agency was we wanted to find our fourth best player, right? We know we've got Dame, CJ, Nurk. Carmelo is unique, obviously. But to have a guy on Damon CJ's timeline and with Nurk that we knew every night we have a fourth guy we can depend on instead of really trying to kind of cobble it together with multiple options. And we identified some guys around the league where contractually we could construct a deal. And, you know, Cub was at the top of that list when we indexed towards defense being a priority. So that was a big get for us. I mean, we think we have – now we know we've got a fourth guy every night that can make a high enough impact to give us a chance to win. It's not just going to be Dame, CJ, and Nurk. I mean, Mello was phenomenal last year, you know, being that guy. But it was in a really awkward year where Nurk was out for the most part. Hoodie was out. You know, we were kind of cobbling things together. We really didn't go all the way in with our main group until the bubble. So, like I said, having a guy who's 30 years old, same age as Dame and CJ, same contractual timeline as Nurk, was really important, but, you know, that balancing act of being able to win now, maintain future flexibility, but also make guys know that they have an ability to stay with us if things are working based on our history of making commitments to players that, you know, are successful here and make us successful. You know, I, I Jason, I mean, not to go off on a tangent, but it's not dissimilar to the rest of the roster, right? We, we want to win now. In order to do that, we need vets. We need guys with proven bodies of work but we're still towing the line with really good young talent like Anthony Simons, Nasir Little, CJ Ellaby, Harry Giles, and Zach Collins. So, you know, the goal coming into the year was we want, we were number two in offense in the NBA, 
27th in defense. And the idea was, was a sliding scale. How do we, how do we try to maintain the offensive end while improving the defense without sacrificing too much on the offensive end? And we think we're able to do that. It was the same with the construction and the balance of the roster. How do we get more veteran help that can help us win right away, have the opportunity to be a part of the future based on their contractual situation, but also not sacrifice all of our young talent and our future to continue to build the infrastructure of the roster on a long-term basis? All right, we're gonna, uh, no more questions in the queue, so we're gonna wrap it up there. Thank you very much for your time, Neil. Uh, thank you everyone for coming on. And just a reminder, we're gonna have Robert Covington at three o'clock this afternoon. Thanks everybody, appreciate you being on, stay safe.